get in, when you come together corporately, the most wonderful thing that happens with me is it, it kind of enhances and enlarges the presence of God, the worship. I mean, the presence of God is everywhere on this earth. He's, he's everywhere. He's there every day all around us. But for us to stop and be aware, the more we're aware, the more we're in tune with the presence of God, um, the better it is in our life, in the journey. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is grace. In his presence is peace. And we are in his presence, but then we're made more aware of it. And so we experience it more. Some of us, not just here, obviously, in this building, but many of us in the journey, um, and, and those of you on YouTube that are watching, we need to experience the presence of God. We need it. It's, it's there. He's never left us. He promised he would never leave or forsake. But there's times we feel alone. There's times we feel, um, where are you? And so to stop and be aware of his presence is so important, whatever that is for you. That may look different for different people. It may be going for a walk in the woods. It may be uh, sitting in a bathtub with bubbles. You know, it may be laying on your bed with a fan blowing on you. Um, you know, it may be whatever, riding in your car, wherever it is that we can take a moment and just be aware. I was telling Brian this morning, he said, how was your, your little mini vacation? And I said, you know, the thing that I learned in Florida, and I was for two days in a hotel by myself with no car and really no contact with anyone but me, except for a few people at like the tiki bar and there's a tiki bar there and there was a pool, but really no Nobody but me and my thoughts for two days straight, which if you know me, I'm a people person. In fact, when I first got there, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to like this. This is going to be really weird, sleeping alone, being alone for 24 hours. You know, what am I going to do with myself? Oh, my goodness. I could have stayed for five more days. But I didn't know that. I've never done that in my life. Even when I went to Africa, I was around people. I stayed in someone's home. I was always, you know, interacting with somebody. And I always felt, in one sense, a little bit of ob obligation, you know, to converse and to do what they're doing and to be connected in that. So when I went to Florida and I had those two days in a hotel that was offered to me for free, I was just like, hallelujah. You know, and I, I spent my birthday money that people gave me to go. I was like, I'm saving this. And I use that to go, and I would do it again. Maybe next year when my birthday comes, I would just send me to Florida for two days or three days. But when I went there, it was, I told Brian, I said, it was such a reboot for my soul because I had different concerns and worries and frets that I didn't even know were kind of just, they just pick at you and, you know, nag at you. And when I went there, I didn't think about any of that at all. There was none of that to, you know, be in my stimulus, my stimuli around me. It was, it, my sight had changed. What had happened with my sight was a beautiful pool, five-star hotel, and sand, white sand, and warm weather, and sunshine. And even when there was a thunderstorm, I was loving the thunderstorm. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. It sounds beautiful. And I mean everything about it, but it rebooted my soul. And I told my husband, I said, we have to do this. Everybody has to reboot your soul. I don't know what it takes for some of us, but maybe just, you know, like if, if you want to camp, go get a tent, go get out in the middle of the woods and camp for a day or two by yourself even. And just watch what happens to your soul because literally everything went away. And I rebooted. I don't know how to, two days. And then after two days, I went and spent the rest of the time with Kaylee and Laura and Laura's family. And it was wonderful. It was glorious. But those two days was, it was a lesson learned to me. And I needed it. So I'm giving you the lesson that I learned. And it was reboot. 
in his presence reboot. Every day when you, even if it's just a moment to yourself with the Father, reboot and allow the worries, the stress, the cares, the things that sometimes weigh on us to just leave. I know my brother has been here for the weekend, him and Jenny, and uh, he drives to Sault Ste. Marie every day, goes across the Mackinac Bridge. The Mackinac Bridge would reboot me every day. I love going over the Mackinac Bridge. I know there are people like Laura, we won't talk about her behind her back, but we are going to. She hates bridges. We're going to. We're, we're praying here over every bridge in Florida. She's like, there's a bridge. There's a bridge. We're like, oh, there's a bridge. Yes. And she's like, there's a bridge. I just got to drive her across the Mackinac. You did drive her? Did she do okay? Oh, yeah, she did fine. She just closed her eyes. I said, look over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we love Laura. Bless her heart. But, you know, it was my brother. My brother gets to reboot every day. And. So thank God. Him and Jenny came down this weekend. You know, all things work together for good to those who love the Father. And God shows me constantly how much he loves me. He goes beyond and above. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, he sent my brother down. My brother <laughs> and Jenny, they had really nice plans for this weekend. We're going to come down. We're going to go to a movie. Then we're going to go yard sailing. We're going to go to the beach. We're going to have so much fun together. And then we had Nate at the house. And then the day that Nate was leaving, the night before, my husband was like, I'm ripping out all the cupboards in the kitchen, everything. We're going to rip it out. So he started while Bethany was cooking us a glorious meal, packing up all the cupboards and getting everything out from underneath her. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? For real? You're doing this right now? Oh, yeah, we're doing this right now. And I'm like, oh. So he ripped the whole, by the time they had left, the, the kitchen was pretty clear, ripped out all the cupboards, took them outside, took them over to Habitat or Odin's, and I have no cupboards at all in my kitchen. And my brother and my sister, I didn't really tell them. I told them I have no kitchen, but they showed up, and there's no kitchen. Our bathroom sink is the dishwasher. So we have had a glorious weekend together. <laughs> And he has helped us. I told, we laid in bed last night, and my husband said, I could have never done this. I, didn't, I could have not done this. I needed another man. And I, I would have been stuck with you in Israel trying to shove a cover up, you know, with your shoulders holding it, and that just wouldn't work. Those were way too and those cupboards were heavy. And we're going to talk about the cupboards today because they're part of the journey. <laughs> this is what's so cool with God. I'm going to talk about all kinds of things today, and I'm going to try to get through it quickly. <laughs> I have 45 minutes. I'm going to do it, do it, do it. <laughs> but the journey of love, guys, I have said this for a long time, that we are here to learn how to love. Amen. And I'm changing my tune. I'm changing it. I'm going to tell you why. I believe we are not here to learn how to love as much as we are here to learn how to be loved. That And I'll give you scripture for that. So we're going to go to the scripture, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. And yes, learning how to be loved will help us learn how to love. But our greatest mission in life is to learn how to receive love. And you guys, every single one of us, like, like Pastor Darren was saying this morning, we all had papas to show us the love of God. Some people on this day, this is not a good day for them. This is a painful moment. This is a painful day, especially if their example of a father was abusive or mean or angry and they haven't maybe dealt with resolving that. Then this day can be more painful than it is happy. But we are all on this journey and God gave us a father and the, the goal in the, the heart of the Father was for our Father to represent him, to be an example of what Father actually looks like. Now, did we do it perfectly, even the fathers in the room and those that are new and coming to fatherhood and got a candy bar to prove it? And so if I, got, I go too long today, eat your flipping candy bar. 
You'll be okay. You already ate part of it? Okay. He's preparing. But here's the thing. Hi, honey. Sorry we forgot you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, the, the father, he's on a, he's on a quest. I, 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 you guys, the older I get, the more I realize God is so passionate and on a quest to show us love. His love, how much he loves us, how crazy he is about us. And he has been proving more and more to me that, that it almost, it surprises me, it overwhelms me, it, um, it leaves me speechless, which is a miracle. But he does this, and he's been doing this to me, and um, I, I don't know how maybe to express how I see the love of God has changing me in the last few years, but it has been. It has been, especially towards myself and then towards others. So I want to read this. Ephesians 3.14 says, For this reason, I'm reading the, in the Amplified, the girls' version. Okay? For this reason, grasping the greatness of this plan, by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this brought Paul to his knees. From whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. God, the first and ultimate Father. Okay, this, is, this here is so cool. God's the Father of everyone on this earth. Heaven and earth. Everyone. He didn't think about anybody. May he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened, spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self, indwelling your innermost being and personality so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. It's through faith. And may you have been, having been deeply rooted and secured, grounded in love. See, the only thing that's going to really ground us in this life, deeply rooted and secure is love. Yeah. Love is what makes every human secure and feel grounded in life. I, I've had it for years on my wall. The way a father can show his kids that he loves them is to love their mother because there's a security in children when they see their parents love each other. Be gracious towards each other. Be kind. So, okay, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith and you, having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, being fully capable of comprehending with, comprehend, comprehending with all the saints, God's people, the width and length, height and depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing, endless love and that you may come to know. Here's the thing, guys. Practically, it says, and through personal experience. See, God is not just a talker. He is a doer. He will show you. He is a show-me God. He's not just like, hey, I love you. And then, it, you know, he said to me years ago, love is better spoken unsaid and done than undone and said. So if you say you love me but don't show me, don't say it, it's better not to say it. It's better to show someone you love them than to never, than to never say it. Right. It's actually better to show them. I mean, not that you shouldn't say it because there's words people that really need it. But show people. Let our actions and our words line up with each other. And God does that. It says that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives completely filled and flooded with God himself. Wow. Wow. That whole scripture there is just full. It's huge in a nutshell. That we can be, 
have the richest experience of God's presence in our lives, completely filled and flooded with God himself. And it's going to come through love that we can come to know personally and through experience the love of God. Personally and through experience. He wants us to experience love. And he, he's, I'm telling you, God is on a quest to love us. And he brought this to me, and then he, he started talking to me about the prodigal son. He said, you know, Cindy, the prodigal son, that story, even, it's even said the prodigal son. If you, I mean, anytime you look it up, it said that in the Bible. But I think it's about the awesome father. Right. Right. I think it should be renamed right. the awesome father. Yep. Yep. Because in that story, and I want to read you, I want to read you a poem that God give me. And I want to talk just for a minute about this story. But, you know, in this story, you know, there's two sons. There's the younger. There's the older. There's the younger one. And this, the example that I think God is giving in this story is no matter where you're at, if you're the younger, where you're frivolous and you're, um, you don't think things through, you want your inherit, you're impatient, you're, you're not as honoring, because obviously the younger son was not as honoring, but then the older son wasn't either, but it doesn't show up as ugly. It was more inward. Where the, uh, the, see, the, the older son that stayed at home was more of an inward ugly. The younger son who left was more of an outward ugly. But nevertheless, they both had their ugly. Yeah. And it was all about the father loving them in the journey and loving their ugly. Right. Yeah, right. And so the younger who's impatient and he comes to dad and says, give me my inheritance right now because I want to go have fun. And dad did. He didn't even sit there and argue like, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah. I don't want to give it to you right now. He just did. He gave it to him. And then he goes out with, we call it riotous living or wasteful living. We don't even know what that looked like. We, I mean, we pegged him with prostitutes, doing drugs. You know, this kid was horrible. We really don't know. All we know is his money ran out. He got hungry because a famine came, and he started living with the pigs. And in the process of living with the pigs, he's like, you know, Dad's house was better. I think I'll just go home, and I'll be a servant. See, the journey for the younger son was to discover love. Mm -hmm. right. He was pretty self-absorbed. And in, in life, have you ever been self-absorbed? Yeah. Huh. Everybody say yes, yes. or I'm going to say you're lying. <laughs> because we go through a self-absorbed state, and then we, you, you guys, you want to know what will break you out of the self-absorbed state more than anything? Is be a father. Yeah. Have, a Have one child. <laughs> Usually, because you will find out what self-sacrifice is. You know, when that baby cries at 2 in the morning, okay, my husband slept through it, but you will realize, because <laughs> I nursed, so he got up before, but he would sleep right through the crying after a while. It was literally with Kaylee, Kaylee had colic so bad for two, two full months, I bounced the bed, I bounced it, I jumped on the end of the bed till 2 and 3 in the morning trying to get her to stop crying, he slept through it. He actually, I think, enjoyed the bouncing. <laughs> the man slept right through it. But I watched him. You know, there may be areas that they, they, they can sleep, but the sacrifice of a father to work and to supply and provide and all the things that daddies do, is amazing, and it will, it will draw you out of your own self-absorbed self-state. I mean, it just will. Children have a way of doing that, and thank God for it. But see, Father does that on purpose to you. It's to make you uncomfortable, because God, I've said forever, is not concerned about your comfort. He is concerned about your character. And so he looks at you, and he says, I need to teach you what love looks like, so therefore, we're going to go through a little bit of a, you know, a, a little bit of turbulence. I don't know why, and especially the American church and maybe our mindset, we think if something goes wrong, that we've done something wrong. They must have done something wrong because look what's happened to them. We have the, the, 
mentality of judgment and of, um, you know, punishment. So, you know, if somebody goes through a storm, well, what did they do? Why is that? You know, they did it in the Bible. Who did this? You know, his parents, did they sin? It's a mindset. And Jesus is like, no, just part of his journey. Well, his journey isn't as fair as someone else's. Why did you do that to him, God? So I could show him how good I am when I opened up his eyes. Didn't Jesus say that? Because of the miracle. So, yeah, he went through some stuff, but do you think after his eyes were opened, he ever, ever, ever forgot about the blindness and what the Lord did for him? Now, did God give him the blindness? No. But he sure would use it to show him how much I love you. So, you know, here's the thing. I want to tell you, just to talk just for a second about this, this journey the younger son was on. And then the older son, you know, after the younger son says, I'm going to come home, I love this. When he says, I'm going to rise and go to my father. This is in Luke, guys, chapter, I don't know. I just, it's in Luke, okay? Just find it. <laughs> verse 11 of Luke something. Okay, I forgot to put the verse there. But it says, I'm going to rise, I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be your son. See, he was going back to God, crawling on his knees. I'm going to gravel at your feet. I'm going to just say what a, you know, a low-down scumbag I am, and hopefully you'll just let me live in one of the servants' quarters and I can have the scraps. Unfortunately, that's a lot of the mentality of some Christians. I used to barter with God. You know, God, you know, if you will do this for me, you know how frugal I am. You know I get everything at yard sales. You know that blah, 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 blah. And I would barter with him. Like, you know, like I deserved it because I was so frugal. And God had to break that mentality, and he's still breaking that mentality off of me. Like, you know, and Jenny's was here this weekend, and Kendall was reading about how much a ridiculous priced ticket to the ball game cost in a certain seat, which was like $60,000, Kendall, $60,000 for a ball game ticket. Now, okay, wow. now here's the thing. It's just paper, right? It's just paper. <laughs> it's just paper. For instance, I got an email this week from someone, and it said, when NASA first started their, you know, their program with space right. and the astronauts were out in space, the pens wouldn't work, the ink pens. They could not get them to work in space. So they spent $128 million to develop an ink pen that would work in space. Wow. And he said the Russians just use pencils. <laughs> I read that and I'm like, really? What could we have done with $128 million? Ridiculous. And then they're like, it's tax time, enjoy. You know? Um, so, but my sister said to Kendall, she's like, Kendall, it's just paper, basically. And if somebody wants to spend $60,000 on a ticket, let them. Who cares? What does it matter if they have it? It might be $6 in their mind because they have that much money. To us, we look at that like, we almost get indignant and mad. What? But I think with the father, I'm obviously we can do a lot with the $128 million or even 60000 But in one sense, the father's trying to get every single one of us to think kingdom. And from his perspective, which is absolutely just never-ending supply. For the entire world, not just the rich, for everyone on the planet. And poverty really, really is a big... It's, a mindset too. it's horrible. Yeah. And it hurts people, and it kills people. So, okay, that being said, this younger son, he's like, I'm going to gravel, I'm going to go home to dad, I'm going to try to make dad realize that maybe, you know, I'm worthy Maybe I'll just get worthy to be a servant. And so what does dad do? I love this. He said, you know, as he's coming, 
Dad sees him afar off and he runs to him. And he says, put the ring on his finger, put the robe on him, give him shoes. I'm going to show you who I am based on me, not your opinion of me. Because the younger son had the wrong opinion of his father. Even in the pig pen, he didn't know his father. So dad had a job to do to show him, listen, you you still don't know me. There are people sitting in pews all over America today that don't know their father. They have the perception, the perception of what was preached to them from the pulpit, from somebody who had a PA or a DA or a AA behind their name. <laughs> and they, they have this perception of God that is so skewed. And then when you come and you say God loves everyone, they can't, they can't believe it. Their religious mind is like, well, we know he loves you. I had people tell me, and I've had them tell me, I know God will hear you when you pray. Way up in Boynt. Will you pray about this? Because I know God hears your prayers. And I'm like, well, he hears yours too. No, not like he hears yours. Because we were taught that God only hears the righteous prayers. That God only hears the Christian prayers. God only hears those that are, you know, they're worthy of hearing their prayers. And he doesn't listen to everybody's prayers and we give ridiculous scriptures about it. That were written from a perception, perception, I should say, of God. That was just skewed, and we believed it. And there's, there's pews filled all over America with people that don't think right about their father, just like this young man. Uh-huh. So then he comes home, and the brother looks at him like, you don't deserve to be here. Right. He had the wrong perception also. I have worked forever for this guy. This farm is mine. You need to go sit out in the slave house. He was no different. He didn't understand his father. And God was telling him, come on inside. Go out and get the older brother who's out pouting. Come inside and celebrate with me. And that's always been the heart of the father. I I wanted to read this to you. This is a poem God gave me a long time ago. And I loved it because... (laughs) um, Back in the day, in, in this era when it said this gentleman or this man ran, he was a dignitary. He was wealthy. And he picked up his, because they had robes, he picked up his robe to run. You're not going to just run, you know, down the road. Anybody wearing a maxi skirt, you know, girls know, a maxi dress or whatever, you, you're going to get tangled up and fall. So I, I heard this message on Papa Runs Like a Girl. Because when Mary ran to the tomb, she gathered her, her clothes up around her and took off running to the tomb, tomb. And so she's like, you know, she's undignified. She was undignified in the way she ran. Girls are made fun of many times for the way they run. Anyway, you, you run like a girl. What is that supposed to mean? Exactly what it means. <laughs> <laughs> but still. So, but I love this father because... This father was like, I will be undignified. I see, I see my son. I have been waiting and I will look like a fool if need be to run to him. I will do whatever it takes to show him that he is worth it, that he is loved, that he is worthy. And so this poem came out of that mindset. It says, Papa runs like a girl. (laughs) Gathering his robes around him with haste, running down the dusty path, throwing his arms around to embrace, his son had come home at last. Amidst all the tears and the nights spent alone, the father had patiently waited, knowing someday his son would come home. That day he anticipated. The dignified robes, the wealth he possessed, defined as a man of the hour. He walked with an order. That's how he dressed. Elegance, followed by power. A man of renown throughout the land, the strong and compassionate kind. 
yet dignified always, a notable man. With structure, his life was refined. Then the day came, he ran like a lass, gathering his garments around. His poise and position, he couldn't care less. That which was lost now was found. That's just like our Papa in heaven above. I bet he runs like a girl. <laughs> Filled with compassion, inspired by love because of Golgotha's hill. If you have wandered away on your own and see him, just see him gathering his skirt, arms open wide, welcoming you home, washing away all the dirt. Our Papa's almighty, holding all power, holy and awesome is he. His enemies fear, they cringe, and they cower, defeated forever, you see. Yet when it comes to his kids and his heart, he loves you with all of his strength. He's constantly reaching his grace in part, going beyond earthly length, redeeming the sinner because of his grace and bloodshed on Calvary's hill. Gathering you close, he longs to embrace because Papa now runs like a girl. He runs like a girl because he loves you. He'll do whatever it takes. He is such an example of Father. He is the example of father that I, I want to be. Mother, father, he's a many-breasted one. He's our example of love. And so, you know, I wanted, to t I wanted to tell you a really cool story because it's part of the journey, guys. Um, <laughs> there, I was watching this video last night, and uh, there was a young boy, he was 10 years old. And uh, he had had a vision. He said, I would go out in the woods and I would talk to God. And God would talk to me back at 10. And he said, I know that might sound weird to some people, but he said, I talked to God and God would talk to me. He said, one day I'm out in the woods and I have this vision. I see myself in this field. I think he said by his house or his mom's house. And he said, I'm spinning this little girl round and around and around. And she's beautiful. She's dark skinned. And her name was Chloe. And he said, the Lord told me, that's your daughter. Her name is Chloe. At 10. So about 14, he meets, well, he has a neighbor that lives across the way his whole childhood. And uh, they're just friends. It's a girl. And their whole family, their, their families are friends. And they end up becoming friends or staying friends their whole life. She goes off to college and whatever the circumstances are, they reconnect later in life and become really close to each other. And one day they're sitting in the car talking, um, I think on the college campus, and she said, you know, um, they were talking about their dreams and their, you know, their futures. And she said, I know one day I'm going to have a little girl and I'm going to call her Chloe. And he's like, what? She goes, I'm going to have a little girl. I'm going to call her Chloe. He goes, that, you're not going to believe this. But he told her about how God told him that he was going to have a little girl, and he showed her, showed him what the little girl looked like, and that her name would be Chloe. And she's like, well, God's never really talked to me like that, but I've always wanted to name my little girl Chloe, so that's what we're going to do. Well, time goes on, and they get married. They end up falling in love, and they get married, and they were married for a few years and doing mission trips together and just having a wonderful time, and then they decided they wanted to start a family. And so... In their journey of life, they try and try and try, and years go by, and three years go by, and then four years go by, and the girl starts to question the love of God. She's like, you know, all my friends are having babies. Everybody's starting their family, and I can't get pregnant. And she goes, I'm thinking, God, you know what? You're really mean. You're, you're just mean. How could you do this to me? I, I was questioning his love. He was questioning the love of God. He questioned the vision. He questioned, he even saw, heard God, right? And uh, it was straining their marriage. Their marriage was having a hard time. And she said, I, I got really angry and frustrated and, and questioning everything. And um, she said, after a while, we just decided we didn't even care about Chloe anymore. We weren't, even if we had a kid, we wouldn't call it Chloe because it all seemed a lie. So she finally had heard about adoption through somebody, an agency, and 
So she, she said, I think we should adopt. I think we should just file papers to adopt. And he's like, I didn't even want to adopt. I was like, forget it. All my dreams, everything I had believed was just shattered. And she's like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill out the papers. So she went through the whole process. He goes, and I didn't hardly support her at all. I didn't help her. She, my wife did it. She did the whole process of, you know, applying for adoption papers and the whole thing. And she said months went by, and they waited, and um, she gets an email from this adoption agency that said, it's a girl. <laughs> I love it. It's a girl, and she's like, oh, my gosh, somebody picked us. They, somebody picked us to be their parents. So she was so excited, and uh, they told them when the baby was going to be due, and they wanted her to, they wanted, the, the mother wanted to meet them. She picked them, but she wanted to meet them before. She totally agreed, you know, with them taking her baby. And so they drove to another state, and they showed up on her door. And they, It's a beautiful video. You guys can watch it. It'll make you cry. They knocked on her door, and she answers, and he said, when she opened the door, because the, the woman he had married was fair-skinned and blonde, and the little girl he had seen was dark-skinned, dark hair, dark eyes. But when she opened the door, he said it was like looking at the little girl grown up. And it took his breath away. She was Hispanic, darker, beautiful, dark skin, dark hair, dark-eyed woman. And they sat down with her, and they were talking, and she said, I know this is going to seem really weird, guys, but the whole time, she's quite pregnant. She said, the whole time I've been pregnant, I've been calling this baby Chloe. This baby is Chloe. And she goes, you don't have to name the baby Chloe. But that's what I call her. He, start, he said, I started blubbering like a baby. I was literally like, you know, doing this. He said, my wife lost it. She's sobbing. And she goes, you hate the name? You don't like the name? What's wrong? They're like, you don't understand. When the baby was born, of course, her name was Chloe. She looked exactly like what God had showed him at 10. And he said, you know, as I was going through this journey, I realized the love of God. God not only showed me Chloe needed me as a dad, he said, the moment I heard Chloe, I went, he said, literally, the entire past and all the hurt and all the anger and all the questioning left me. And I realized Chloe was destined to be my child all those years ago, and God was giving me a, a view, a moment of the journey and showing me how much he loved me enough to prepare me way back when I was 10 and my wife, and he said, and we wrapped this little girl up and we brought her home and this dark-haired, dark-eyed, beautiful baby girl named Chloe. And I started thinking about that. I thought, God, sometimes in the journey, when things aren't going right, we can doubt the Father's love because we don't see the whole picture. We don't see the Chloe. We don't know she's out there waiting, just like God said. We think you're being mean to me. You tricked me. You did this. You did that. But we don't see what God has. And he is so desperate to prove his love to us and to show us the real view of who he is and what he really looks like. And when you can just chuck everything except for what Jesus looks like and what Jesus said and what Jesus acted like, when you get to that place, you know, I had a friend tell a friend that their child was questioning their whole relationship with God based on the Old Testament and how mean he was. An adult child. But they were actually questioning and saying what everybody had thought. Right. Like how could God rip babies out of mother's wombs and call it okay? How could he slaughter entire races based on the fact that they lived on a piece of land that supposedly he wanted? Right. Had done nothing 
but lived on a piece of property that God said belonged to someone else, so go in and kill them all? Right. Those are the questions. And I was telling my friend, I said, you know, I never even questioned that growing up because I was just taught that's just who God was. Right. I mean, some days he's at your, it's a good day for God. Other, when it's a bad hair day for God, look out because, you know, he pulls that long golden or long white beard and he's like, I'm going to whip my beard up. You're making me so mad. Don't be in his way when it's that way. I, I don't, I'll never believe it again, and I don't care how mad people get at me. I wrote something the other day on Facebook, and I posted, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church, bless their ignorant, ignorant hearts. Yep. <laughs> and they had posted a whole thing about Orlando and how God's judgment came down on, you know, this community because of their sin and blah, 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 blah. God's judgment. And I'm thinking, you know, if anybody would get God's judgment, it would be you for being so ridiculously stupid. <laughs> but no, you're still alive and breathing and still spewing all, all your stupidity. <laughs> so obviously you are the biggest expression of grace in my entire life that you're alive. Yeah. Well, there you go. Seriously. But you know, of course, they spew out their garbage. And so I had written this thing. This is not God. This will never be God. This is not what God looks like. This will never be what God looks like. They don't know God at all, period. Let's just make it clear. Does he love them? Oh, my goodness, he's trying to prove to him. I'm sure he's given them, trying to give them experiences, people's voices, whatever it is. I love you, but... I don't know if he's gotten through yet. There's some really thick-headed people in that group. I'm trying to be nice because I love the religious. I really do. Jesus did. But they stretch me. I would rather not talk about it. Amen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Breathe. Okay. But here's the thing. I posted this. And I actually had, and, and one, one of my friends was like, you know, why are you posting? It was something I had posted before. Why are you even posting? That's not going to happen. People aren't going to say this is God's judgment. I'm like, really? You don't know people very well. Yeah. There, it's going to happen. Just wait. Wait for it. Yeah. Wait. Wait. There it comes. There it comes. Because Katrina happens. Rita happens. Pakistan happens. Whatever happens. 9-11 happens. Anything that happens, oh, you know, well, God never really liked them much anyways. Although when God flooded Orlando, or not Orlando, New Orleans, he forgot Bourbon Street. He left Bourbon Street. I don't know if he likes bourbon. <laughs> but he flooded areas that he should have done better job if he was doing a judgment thing. Just saying, God. So I was waiting for it, and sure enough, yes, it came. And then I'm posting this, and I actually had people preachers that literally were saying, well, you know, it's, I'm not quite sure if it's not the judgment of God for their lifestyle. Because in that lifestyle, things happen. Well, then I told my daughter, I said, well, you know, so the guy that's out messing with his neighbor in adultery next door, he can get away with it because his lifestyle isn't quite as <coughs> to God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you can do all of that, but not this, because this is worse Therefore, you deserve to die the way you died. Or you know what? We're not really saying you deserve to die, but we're not really surprised. It's just garbage, guys. We have got our job cut out for us. Now, don't get frustrated because I have. And it will make you not happy when you see what's cut out for the Christian church to come into a real understanding of who God is. Because the biggest people you're going to fight are the Christians. The sinners are like, really? Seriously, God loves me that much? It's the boy that stayed at home. Mm -hmm. You know, the kid that had left was like, I'm, screw this, I'm done with this life. I just want to have my hair, just, I'm off, I, I'm done. And then you got the one at home that's like, I'll tell you what. Those are the ones that, they're the ones that like, you get out of the house. What are you throwing a party for them for? They don't deserve it. I've been here all along. I'm more righteous. I'm more holy. I've done everything you've ever said. I've always obeyed you. 
Why are you loving them? Don't you dare love them as much as you love me because they don't deserve your love as much as I deserve your love because I've been here doing everything right and they did everything wrong and then they have the fun stuff. Why do they get the fun stuff and I've done everything and I have no fun? Well, you have no fun because you have a bad attitude. It's the way you view Father. I want to share something. God's so good to me. And he's not good to me because he loves me any more than you. He's trying to show me in my journey who he is. I know every single one of you probably have stories where God's showing you who he is to you. And I was sharing this morning. My husband decided, obviously, to rip out the cupboards. I shared that with you, didn't I? Okay. So my kitchen turned into a war zone. <laughs> It was bad. It just looked like everything blew up. In fact, our entire house blew up. Everything in the house, everything. I don't know what the upstairs looks like because I haven't gone up there. I'm hoping it's Natasha cleaned her room. I did go up there. It looked better. I could go to her room for some kind of solace and peace. But like the kitchen moved into the living room and the dining room. My Amazon room was already blown up. And so I was just like, oh, God. And even outside, I couldn't even go outside because we had had... Uh, his birthday party, and we had chairs everywhere and tables everywhere, and the outside looks that way. It's just all chairs and tables, and it's just cluttered. I'm like, I can't even come out here and find some kind of... So we go to Brittany's house, perfect. In fact, we went and saw Seth this weekend. He's like, I'm not Brittany, I'm not Brittany, I'm not Brittany. The minute we walk in the door. <laughs> not everybody's Brittany. I'm like, well, did we say anything to you? He was folding laundry. There was laundry. The, you know, whatever. He, I'm like, come visit me, son. You're going to feel better about your house. But in the whole process, the house just blew up. And I'm like, we were talking about it. He goes, this is the worst our house has ever looked in our entire marriage. There's not one place. Even the bathroom. I started painting the bathroom. I have to tear everything apart. I thought, paint the bathroom now while you're painting the kitchen, painting all the walls in the kitchen. Just rip the whole house up. So that's where we're at, right? But to get to that place, here's the thing. I'm in the kitchen a few, about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, and I am trying to cook. And little by little, the parsonage has been crumbling under our feet. It's been bad. Okay, there's just things that need repaired and fixed. And it's an old farmhouse to begin with. You know, when we bought the house, it had a metal cupboard, one. And it was, that was it. I think it had red handles or something. It was an old tin one, the tin ones. So we were like, this ain't going to do. So we took that off the wall. We went shopping. At the time, our budget was very small. We found used cupboards from a place that were $200 for used cupboards. And at the time, they should have been probably free. free. Yeah. So, but we took them because we were grateful. We'll take these cupboards. Well, it's been, what, 18 years? And, and honestly, guys, they, they've been so sweet. They tried their hardest. <laughs> you know? But I pulled out a drawer the other day, and my, my, my silverware drawer broke. And so, because it, the top isn't, it's just not good enough now. So we moved it to the next drawer down. So this drawer is just the junk drawer, and it, it takes lighter stuff. So now we have the silverware drawer. Well, then the silverware drawer broke again, the second drawer down. I'm like, and I'm in the kitchen cooking going, I'm going to scheme, I'm going to scheme. I can't stand this kitchen. I can't stand this kitchen. I need to be thankful there's people without kitchens, but I can't stand this kitchen. <laughs> and then, you know, we pull out the utensil drawer, and that would just, that, that's been fixed like four times, maybe five. It, the utensils go through to the bottom cupboard, and I'm just like, I, I, I can't take it. I, I, so I'm the only one in the kitchen, pull out the drawer, and it just, everything was just a mess. And I'm like, God, I can't take this anymore. I hate these covers. I really hate these covers. And you know, my husband, he gets tools. He gets, he gets tools for his job. He has a job. He, gets, he said the right tool, and you have to have the right tool. If you don't have the right tool, it takes you forever to do something. You know, so you need the right tools. I need the right tools in this kitchen because I don't enjoy cooking. I don't want to be out here. So I'm whining and complaining to God. I said, I just need cupboards. I need, you know what? No, I, need ni I want nice cupboards. I want nice cupboards. I want them real, 
really reasonable. I want to be able to afford these nice cupboards, but I want really nice cupboards. Thank you. Thank you, Father. And I can't even say I had the best attitude because I was mad. <laughs> and so, I don't know, we go to the gym. Well, first of all, our, our dryer, which was the same age, broke. It, was, it had been squealing for about a year and a half. You know where you do the dryer? It was, <laughs> when it starts, <laughs> and, and, and when it stops, it does, <laughs> you know, you're like, <laughs> you guys, now my dryer sings to me. It goes, tilly ting, tilly tilly tilly. no, that dryer screamed in pain. <laughs> so we knew when the dryer was done, ah, you know, but the problem got, it screamed the entire time it dried. It was, so we would have to turn the TV off. <laughs> It's, it's not funny. It, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny then. It's horrible. So we'd have to turn the TV up because the dryer was so loud. Well, finally it died. Thank God. I mean, Pastor Darren. I'm sorry. But they came, they fixed it. The problem was, is there was this part in the front that needed to replace it. We didn't replace it. So the drum starts to come out of the dryer and it's just, and it killed it within just a short while. So I'm like, okay, dad, it's dead. We can't, there's nothing we could do. We have to get another dryer. So I'm online going Craigslist, yard sales, nothing. And I finally find this washer and dryer and it was okay. It was like $500 for the both of them. You had to buy them together. You couldn't buy them separate. But then when I read the reviews, it was horrible, horrible, horrible reviews. Like, Mold, you're going to have mold. It's going to make your laundry you stink. You have to leave them open. I'm like, no, we're not doing this. So he's like, let's go to Sears. Let's just see if we can find something at Sears. So we go shopping. We go to like Odin's and, you know, all these places. We go to Sears and they had a floor model that was half off the price. And I'm like, hey, I can live with that. It's just a floor model. I had a couple little scratches on it. It's okay. Everybody gets scratches in life. And it's probably going to get scratches in my house. So let's, that might be working. But I told the lady, I said, well, we're going to first of all go down to Habitat for Humanity and see if they have anything. And then we'll come back and see you if they don't. So we go down to Habitat for Humanity and we walk in and we're just, I didn't even go look for, my, let my husband go look. I was looking at other stuff. Well, he comes up to me and goes, honey, come, I want to show you something. So we walk towards the back and there's a set of cupboards. And they were pretty nice. They were like whitewashed, lighter, I don't know if they were oak, maple. They were pretty. The first set. The first set's not maple. Those are oak. So we're looking at them. I'm looking this way at the cupboards. And there was quite a few. I'm like, you know what? These will probably do. Let's see. What do they got? And I'm, this is a lot of cupboards. This, this will be good. He goes, honey, turn around and look behind you. So I do this. And there's these cupboards that were amazing to me. I mean, they take my breath away. I mean, at that time, I was like, I opened one of the drawers. I opened the cabinet. I was like, oh, I need these cupboards. Oh, my gosh, these cupboards. And they were, they were light, maple, whitewashed, beautiful cupboards, right? I'm like, these are the cupboards I need. So we asked the lady, how much? She goes, well, they're still coming off the truck. We don't know the price. You're going to have to wait. I'm like, I can't wait. I need to know. I want to buy these. How much? She's like, we don't know because the person that prices them, so she gave me the spiel. So we, we kind of went back and forth. I'm like, okay, but I'm going to leave because they were going to close. I, I'm going to leave, but listen, I have to know. I have to be able to get these covered. So I'm gonna, if I have to stand here and wait for you, I will stand here. We will stand in this store and wait. And she's like, no, 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 no. My mom's the one that prices it. So cool. So we were like, tomorrow we'll do it. Well, we went to the gym. And I'm at the gym, and I'm telling you the whole story. You've got to have the whole story, okay, <laughs> to really know how good God is. I'm at the gym, and I'm thinking, I'm going to really do some crunches. I'm going to so get in tune. My stomach and everything's. I'm losing fat today. <laughs> so I'm overdoing it. Like, I, sure, I lost 10 pounds. But I got in the shower, and my back went, Ugh. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I can't move. I can't move. I can't bend over. I can't stand up. I don't know what to do. So I was like getting, trying to get dressed, you know. I got myself dressed, 
tried to carry my gym bag. I'm sliding it out to the door. And I told my, I was sliding it. It was so much pain. I can't explain to you. I've had five children. Give me another child. So I tell him, I'm like, I can't move. My back. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what to do. He's like, get in the car. Call the chiropractor. We're on our way. Well, he had called because we were supposed to get the cupboards. He had called them, and they didn't answer. And then they said, come back in an hour. Or they answered, come back in an hour. Calling and come back in another hour. And then they didn't answer. He goes, we're just driving there. I'm like, oh, I have to go to the chiropractor. So we drive there. We end up, I leave him. I go to the chiropractor, the whole story. He stands there and waits for the price. <laughs> and they give to me an amazing price. Like one cupboard would cost, because we've been pricing cupboards. Cupboards are like $250 for a cupboard, just a nice little cupboard, you know? They give him this price, and he's like, well, there's another guy there that he had to kind of tussle with, because the guy came in and saw him and goes, I'm buying those. He goes, no, 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 no. I've been here since yesterday. No, you don't understand. I was in a lot, my wife's in a lot of pain. He didn't say this, but I know he's, you're not taking these cupboards. She will kill me. And not just from the back. I will get these cupboards for her. Do you understand? And the guy's like, so the, she gave the price. The guy's like, sold, I'll take him. He's like, no, sold to me. So they kind of went back and forth. Well, we get these cupboards, guys. We're putting them in. And my brother comes down on the perfect weekend. He doesn't know he's coming to help me with cupboards. <laughs> he doesn't know, but God loves me so much more than him. <laughs> Not really. God loves me. God's trying to give me a message through my brother and my sister. I love you so much. I'm sending your brother down. They're going to help you put the cupboards in. And you guys won't believe how beautiful these cupboards are. And he did all of that. Because he loves me. And he, he answered my prayer because he loves me. But at least, okay, maybe I'm in delusion and you think it's just a coincidence. Yeah. But I know he loves me. And what's really crazy is when we went to get, we went back, obviously we didn't find a dryer. We went back and we got a dryer. And the lady's like, you really should get the washer to match. I'm like, but my washer's just fine. I mean, it's old, it's a Maytag, and it's, you know, it squeals too. Oh, it squeals. It it had its moments where it'd be like, and when it would ring out, but I'm like, no, my washer's working. She's like, you really should. So we're like, oh. So we end up getting the washer. That's because the washer died the next day. No, we end up getting the washer before it died. Then it died the next day. We're like, God, you love us. The washer died the day after we bought a new one. The dryer died before. But if we, the dryer hadn't died, I wouldn't have got the cupboards. So see, you can get all mad about things and go, why did my dryer die? This is ridiculous. I need a dryer, God. You don't love me. You let my dryer die. But God's like, I really love you enough to kill the dryer now. It was dying anyways. It needed to die. Because for this dryer to live any longer, you would miss the cupboards. So you have to find the cupboards. And... And, and, and by the way, you need to get a washer because your washer's about to die too. So listen to the lady. Here's the thing. This is how I think God thinks about us. Because he cares about every aspect of your life. And he sets you up for the journey. He tells you about Chloe when you're 10. So that when you're 20-something and you have no Chloe and you get mad and you think he doesn't love you, then when he brings Chloe to you, you go, you set me up for the journey all the way back to 10. Yeah. You, you told my wife she was going to have a Chloe. So when she can't conceive and she doubts your love, you still have Chloe planned. Right. And she's the dark-skinned Chloe that doesn't look anything like your wife, and you could never figure that one out. Because yeah. that's just who he is. Yeah. And that is what he's trying to get across to all humanity. I am better than you think. I am better than you ever, ever, ever could imagine. And I'm going to show you how good I am if that's the last thing I ever do with you. And that's what the journey's about, is learning to know the Father's love. Yeah. Come on now. So I'm on a quest to understand his love more. And maybe I test him. Maybe you can get to be a real stink and test him at times. But he never, ever ever stops loving me, never stops proving himself to me, even in my moments where I'm just a jerk. He just says, you know, let me just show you how much I love you. 
And that's what Father's Day is about. Good fathers. We sang beautiful songs today. It went perfect. It's who you are, God. And I'll never doubt it. Okay, I say that now. Maybe there'll be times that if I ever doubt his love, he's like, okay. It's just the next, next leg of the journey. It's just the next level that you have to rise to yeah, right. yep. that I'm going to show you. When you're in those dark times, I'm going to remind you of the light. Yeah. Yeah. It's in those places yeah. that we need to remember. It's when Chloe's not there and you say, God, but, but you said... He's like, I know, I know. Just hang on. The journey's not over. It's when God told you this or that about your child and you see them go off to the pig pen. And you're like, what in the world is happening right now? God's like, hang on. I told you this about them when they were born or in the womb. I just want to encourage you today, guys. Whatever your journey looks like, in the middle of it all, see the fingerprints of God proving love to you proving love to you, even in the places where you think, you didn't come through for me, God. It's not over yet. You, you, you let me down. Well, I'm going to show you something about me. Because here's the thing. We think everything has to go perfect. Things should be easy and, you know, in order. And, and for God to love me, everything should be perfect in life. Or he's not showing me he loves me. But I don't see that example in the Bible. I see the Daniels in the lion's den. I see the three Hebrew children in the fire. I see the Paul who said, I've been beaten unconscious and died. I see every disciple that was hanged upside down or crucified or died for Christ. I see the places where our American mind goes, no, then you, you, you let me down. And they said, like Peter said, I love the fact that I can give my life for Christ. What the, what? Why in the world would you say that? Because they experienced the love of Father. So whether this side or we step to that side, it's all about love. It's all about love. And I will love every person. I will be on a quest to love every person, whether I agree with them, I don't agree with them, whether their lifestyle insults what I believe is holy and righteous or not. I will love them to life. I will love them to life. I'm already seeing the effects of that with people, loving someone in the place they are. And, and even seeing on Facebook, some of their postings, it's like, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I, I love Jesus. And I'm like, whoa, what? And God had shown me that before. Loving someone and treating them like they know Father. Treating them like they like, love God. Yeah. And then seeing them actually go, you awakened something in me I didn't even know was there. You made me want to love God. Mm-hmm. Why? Because we believe that about them. Yeah. Guys, today I want you to know God loves you. Daddy loves you. You're on his mind. You're in his heart. He, he wants to give you cupboards. <laughs> He wants to give you a washer before it breaks and then dry. I mean, you're like, well, it's all natural things. Yeah, but it makes my life easier because when you've got things going on, you need some easy buttons, you know, like you need a reboot sometimes. God's like, you know what? I want you to go to Florida. I want you to take two days for yourself. Well, do you, do you know how much that costs? Fine, I'll give you the birthday money. I just want you to go. I want you to experience a moment with just me. Yeah, I found gold at yard sales. Just, you know, $2 gold bracelet, solid gold bracelet. Gave one away, find another one. That's just who God is. There's, I'm telling you guys, maybe your journey looks different than mine because I'm a treasure hunter. It's all about the treasure with me, and it's as fun hunting as it is getting. After you get us kind of let down, God, I'll find another treasure. That's why I bought those machines. I have like two of those treasure hunters. It's way more fun yard selling for me. I should go there and do this over all their stuff. (laughs) Gold, you know. But it's all about, to me, people are treasures. I love talking. Tim left me at a yard sale Friday because he had to run to the bank. And it's so funny because I just sat and talked to the lady and loved on her. And it was a blast. 
meeting new people. It's just down the road from me. I'm just like, well, I'm like, then I'm like, thanks for letting me stay and talk. She goes, I'm glad you did. That was really fun. And nobody was there until just before he came. I mean, it's all about, I'm telling you, it's all about the journey. Guys, don't judge your journey before it's over. And please, for God's sake, don't judge somebody else's. Please don't look at somebody else and say, well, they must be a bad person because this isn't happening for them. Or God loves them more because this is happening for them and he doesn't happen for me. Please don't do that. Know that he's got his own experiences for you to show you the Chloe. How many years did it take for Chloe to come? Ten, and it was four years of his marriage and she had graduated from college. And he's crying in this video. I, I should find the video and post it. it. I just watched the whole thing last night. Just, it was such a, I love stories. Father, today, may we experience your love. God, more than anything, please, please help this world to understand your love. They're desperate to understand. They're desperate, God. This humanity is desperate to know you love them. And Father, as a church, in general, overall, we repent for being such a representation, poor representation of who you are. I know you're changing everything. You've got us on a, you've got a revolution going of, of revealing who you are to this world. And we're right smack dab in the middle of it. And it's okay. I, I'm loving this part of the journey. And I'm going to receive this part of the journey that if I can be a spokesman of your heart, I will of who you really are, what you really look like, I will. I will, Father. I thank you, Father, that you will reveal more and more and more and more of your heart as, as time goes on to humanity, to all of us, every single one of us. Heal bodies today, Jesus answer prayers today. I want you guys today, this morning, okay, maybe it's not cupboards, but what has frustrated you? Something that's frustrated you. Maybe you need a, a new pair of sandals. Maybe, you know, your underwear have holes and you don't have money for new. I don't know. What is it? Maybe it's small. Maybe it's large. Maybe it's, you know, with me, I just want to kick the cupboards. What is it that you want from Father today? Not need. I needed them, but I wanted them. Jesus never asked, what do you need, ever. Study it out. He never said, what do you need? He said, what do you want? So what do you want? What do you want? Ask the Father right now. Ask him. It's Father's Day. He's a good, good father. Ask him, Father, this is what I want. Maybe you want... One of your kids to come home. Maybe you want a connection with someone. Maybe you want, um, you know, chocolate mousse cake. I don't know. What do you want? Maybe you want a new car. Maybe you just want to feel his love. Maybe you feel empty and depressed and you want that to go away. Maybe you just want your body to be healthy and strong. Father, today we just, we ask you for it. You said ask, believe, receive. So we're asking today. Because you're so good. You're so good. You're so good.